of a conversation between uh, Prime Minister Eshkol and Golda Meir. What the conversation goes that uh, Eshkol says that he wants the dowry without the bride, where the dowry is the land and the bride is the people. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Raverman. I'm the executive director of Kairos USA. And I want to welcome you to, to this next in a series of webinars sponsored by the, International, the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace and the Stones Cry Out Virtual Delegation. Um, the, International, the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace is a co-organizer of the Stones Cry Out Coalition. Uh, and this is one in a series uh, focusing on aspects of Palestinian resistance um, and U.S. policy toward Israel and the Palestinians. The next, so um, I am I'm just personally really pleased to have the opportunity to to to, to talk with with Neve Gordon today. Neve um, is a third generation uh, Israeli. Uh, he received his doctorate in Notre Dame in 1999. And then that same year began his career at Ben Gurion University in, in Israel in the Department of Politics and Government, where he quickly rose um, to the um, to be a full a professor. And um, I'm going to post right now. I'm going to ask Pam to post um, three links in the chat. These are just these are the first one is. An article was published in the, in the LA Times, an op-ed piece in the New York Times, in the LA Times in 2009, uh, which I'll refer to. And the other two are very recent articles. Both came out in 2024. <coughs> Amazing pieces of work. <coughs> They're academic, and I will say, but they read really well. It just don't worry, don't be turned off by the fact that it's that that, that it's an academic piece. These are wonderful, wonderful essays and works of scholarship, and I really recommend um, that, that, that you read them. You will learn a lot. I learned um, a lot. So Neve is just, he's a terrific guy and a very, very impressive scholar um, with, an interesting, um, with an interesting history. Um, in this 2009 article that he uh, published in the was carried by the LA Times. It's the the the, uh, the headline is boycott Israel. And Neve can fill in sort of the blanks, but uh, the the short story is that by 2017 he decided to move himself and his family out of Israel and to London, where he is now a, a professor at uh, at Queen Mary University, doing amazing work and. There's one line in, in this article uh, in the LA Times that has always stuck with me. Uh, he shows himself sitting in his backyard watching his two boys, who were boys at the time, swinging on their swing. You know, in, in the Negev Desert, you know, in the heart of it. Yeah. And what he writes here is, the question that keeps me up at night, both as a parent and as an Israeli citizen, is how to ensure that my two children, as well as the children of my Palestinian neighbors, do not grow up in an apartheid regime. So that, that, that's enough for the introduction. Um, now, I'm sure I've forgotten lots of important things, but if you Google me, you can take a look at all the books he's written. And they're wonderful, they're wonderful books. 2009 was called Israel's Occupation which blew a lot of us away. And I put it right next to it, right next to my, on my shelf, it's right next to Iran Pope's ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Uh, but there are wonderful, wonderful books that have come out since that are not only or just about Israel, but are really cover a broad, broad sociopolitical perspective about our world. And I think that's really important. And I want to come back to that as, 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 as we talk. So, Neve, I'm going to do a couple of little quotes from the articles and then, and then ask you to, to comment and try to do it that way. Um, in the um, 
in the article, the, the lawfare article about uh, Israel's Nakba and um, the destruction of the Gaza's healthcare infrastructure, which just came out. You write, the multiple rounds of military attacks carried out by Israel since the implementation of the siege of Gaza in 2007 should be conceived of as an intensification of the existing pattern of settler colonial dispossession and elimination. Can you expand on that a bit? Hi, everyone. Um, so basically, the first question, I, the way I understood it, is about settler colonials. And what is settler colonialism? It's different than other forms of colonialism. And the idea is that the settler comes and wants the land. That's why, and wants the land, and, and, and that's why the settler is there. And they want the land without the people. When Israel, for example, occupied 19, uh, uh, the West Bank and Gaza Strip in 1967, there is a known quote uh, that I actually, I think I begin my Israel's occupation with it, of a conversation between uh, Prime Minister Eshkol and Golda Meir. What the conversation goes that uh, Eshkol says that he wants the dowry without the bride, where the dowry is the land and the bride is the people. Now, this is part of the logic of settler colonialism because if the settler wants the land, then the settler must displace the people, the indigenous people on the land, and then replace them. And that is the whole logic since 1948 about seizing the land, displacing the, the people on the land, and then replacing them. So if in 1948, for example, 40, 47, 48, the Palestinians made up two thirds of the population in what was mandatory Palestine. And the Jews made up one third of the population. By 1950, the, 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 and in 1948, Israel carries out ethnic cleansing and 750,000 Palestinians are either flee or are expelled from their land and not allowed to return and their villages are destroyed and they are replaced by a Jewish population. By 1950, two years later, those 750,000 people are replaced by Jewish immigrants, whether from Europe or from the Arab countries uh, in the Middle East. And so you see that the population in Israel did not decrease in size. It maintained the same size, but instead of being a majority Palestinian population, it became an overly, overwhelmingly a majority uh, uh, Jewish population. And so this idea of gaining control of the land and, and replacing the, the, the population, displacing and replacing the population is part of the logic since then. But within this logic, there's also the notion of elimination because you want the land without the indigenous population. And so you can either expel them or you can eliminate them. In any case, an elimination does not necessarily mean elimination in the physical sense of elim eliminating someone by killing them. It can mean elimination of their culture, of their tradition, of their elimination as a people. Whatever makes up a people, which is the different customs and culture and traditions and so forth. And what we see over the years is that this logic 
is carried forth throughout because the Nakba, as Peter, uh, as, as um, Wolf teaches us, is not an event. It wasn't the 1948 thing. The, Nak the Nakba is a process. It's the process of displacement and replacement in order to take control of the land. Is that helpful, Mark? Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Let, 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 let's pursue this idea of this sort of continuation. You wrote here, the Nakba continues, and of course you wrote this in 24, so obviously Gaza is on our minds, but um, we all know that the eruption and the intensification of the violence um, <clears throat> in the West Bank picks up exactly at the same time. Um, you know, I was talking to Dawood Nassar, many of you know who he is, and he's had many incursions um, and intensified since October 7th. And at one time, at one point, several weeks ago, two soldiers or settlers dressed as soldiers we don't know anymore, broke into his land, cut through the fence, and told them they had to leave. And they said, why? They said, well, it's not safe here you can come back after the war. So the resonance is there. First of all, they're, they're, this is what people were told in 1948 as well, right? So you have a, a absolute resonance and almost a continuation of, of, of Nakba, one we could say. But anyway, so the Nakba continues to unfold in Gaza as a result of periodic eruptions of violence and ongoing structural violence. This is your theme of, about the healthcare system. It is thus often a slow form of violence that destroys the population's health in a protracted, attritional, and less viscerally alarming way because it is not as immediately visible as eruptive violence and is, uh, which is deployed for a certain period of time before receding. So we think about the calls for ceasefire. <laughs> Fine. But then you know what does ceasefire really mean in, in in the large in the large picture? So basically, I distinguish between two kinds of violence, and I think everyone here will be familiar with both. One violence is the violence you can call it of war. It's the violence of um, it erupts. It's used guns and others. In a domestic setting, it can be the violence that the man hits the woman in a, in a domestic setting. It's the eruptive violence. It erupts, it's very violent often, and then it recedes. However, in every society, what is more prevalent is the structural forms of violence. And these structural forms of violence, they also kill. But the way they kill is very different from eruptive violence. Eruptive violence, you shoot, a, you shoot a bullet and it kills someone. Structural violence is, for example, having a, a, a siege on Gaza and having, let's say, uh, cancer patients that cannot receive medical care in Gaza, because there is no expertise in Gaza, there's not the technology, whatever the reason is, and they're not allowed out of Gaza uh, to, get treat, to get treatment in Israel, in Egypt, in Jordan, wherever. And they ultimately die, but they don't die from a bullet, they die slowly, it's a slow kind of death. The quality of water in the Gaza kills people, where a lot, large percentage of the water is not drinkable. I'm not talking now. I'm talking before the war. Um, and so what you see, interestingly, is that there's a gap of about 10 years of mortality rate between or life expectancy rate between Gaza and Belsheva, where I live, which is a 50-minute drive, okay? 
And that 10 years that when you, if you were born in Gaza, you're going to live till an average of 73. And if you're born in Beersheba, you're going to live till an average of 83. Okay? That's the life expectancy. Those 10 years, that difference is the structural violence. Okay? And it comes through through primarily issues that what we call, if we're dealing with healthcare, the social detriments of health. It's the, the kinds of access that I have to good food, to, to, to good drinking water, to different things that affect my health. And what the Palestinians, so the Palestinians, both in Gaza and in the West Bank, repeatedly confront eruptive violence, but on their daily, daily level, every single day and every single act, there's different forms of structural violence. Structural violence, as opposed to eruptive violence, often doesn't have an agent. What do I mean doesn't have an agent? When a pilot, you know, goes over Gaza and drops a bomb, that's eruptive violence. The agent is the pilot, is the person that's pushing on the button or push pulling the trigger. Eruptive violence, there's no one there. Who, who is making the water not good that people die earlier because of the water? The poverty and so forth. There's no single person that is to blame. And what is affecting the Palestinians, both in Gaza and in the West Bank, is, and, and we, you know, we're outraged is the, by these kind of eruptive violence, but uh, the press, the media is not interested, and most people are not interested by the structural violence that they experience on a daily level. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. So, you know, I think we we can come back to these things, but I want to ask you. Um, I'm going to turn to your article um, on uh, what was the name of it? Uh, Zionism and anti-Semitism. Yeah, the internal operations of the IHRA definition. We all know what that is, um, and uh, there are most of the people on the on the call here who will be listening to the to the uh, to the recording are not jewish so unlike you and me they they don't carry the same kind of baggage and they don't have the kind of internal existential experience of, of, of what that means but it's very very important for people to understand and, and, and the, the quotes that i've chosen here i think uh, hopefully will will highlight this so uh, as we all know, the, I, the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Association, has had great success. You make that clear in your article. It's been adopted by governments and, uh, and by institutions at, at all levels. People love it. In fact, you ask the question, why is it so popular when there's been so much uh, uh, controversy about how flawed it really is? And you can make a very powerful case for why people love it so much. Okay. Anyway, it expands the traditional definition of anti-Semitism, which is hatred of Jews, and we all know what that is. It conflates any form of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, as well as harsh criticism of Israel, as being against the Jewish people. And you make a very cogent and clear argument about the three factors that go into you know why that's true and how it operationalizes the definition. Uh, so basically, to be Jewish is to be Zionist, to be uh, Judaism is, is, is Zionism, and to be a Jew is inextricably tied up with, with connection with the state of Israel. So let's talk about Jewish identity. So you're a third generation Israeli. You were raised from the cradle with a form of that. I'm a second generation American, and I was brought up to believe that Israel was an inextricable part of my identity, that we were special, that we were different, uh, which means only is kind of better by virtue of how much we suffer and that we deserve a nation state to protect us from our enemies. So the, the IHRA codifies that. 
Now, something about that always felt wrong to me. Now it's expressed in my anti-Zionism. But it's broader than that. Um, I think it's coming home to me how what's going on in the United States now is connected to that. So um, you write that it's particularly attractive to broader audiences and certainly to certain political leaders in countries such as India, Hungary, the US, of course, and Poland, because it promotes a notion of democracy that is compatible with an apartheid regime. So you, you introduce this concept, this idea of democratic apartheid. It's a regime in which the notion of the people does not include everybody. That, so, you know, to quote George Orwell, some are more equal than others. And then you say the ultimate manifestation of apartheid democracy is elimination in one form or another. So I wonder if you could you could talk about that. If, you know, speak from from your from your own experience. I mean, your own decision to have, have had to leave um, Israel. Um, and and what do you think it means not just for us Jews, but for but but for people in in general in today's world? Let me begin with go back and then in a roundabout way answer. So we have World War II and we have the Holocaust, in which six million uh, Jews are exterminated. And the Holocaust to be sure is not uh, the first genocide. Uh, the Germans themselves carried out a genocide in Namibia several years earlier. The Americans are settler colonialists like the Israelis, and that's part of the attraction, right? And there was a genocide in, in, in America, both in the United States, but also in Canada, Argentina, Brazil, and so forth. We know this is not the first genocide. It's the first genocide of whites on whites on European soil. And therefore, there is this kind of outrage at it. When we whites kill non-whites, we're not as outraged as when we kill whites. There is this outrage. And out of this outrage emerges what we my field of research, which is the human right, what we call the human right, the post World War II human rights regime. Now, one of the claims of human rights is that we're all human, and we all share something human. And the way to deal with the kind of racism that led to the Holocaust is through human rights through this kind of recognition that we are all human and all by being human have certain rights and that should prohibit others from using violence against us and 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 discriminating against us and ultimately eliminating us so human rights was conceived of as a kind of reaction, as a pushback to the violence of the Holocaust in World War II. Israel did not accept, Israel was not created, but the Zionists did not accept this solution. The Zionists did not feel that human rights uh, uh, could save uh, the Jews, and they felt that the only way to ensure the safety of the Jews is to create a, a Jewish homeland. The Europeans, in a sense, were happy with it. They were happy with this because Israel became the solution for the crimes that they had carried out. They did not need to pay for the crimes they carried out against the Jews. 
who had to pay for the crimes they carried out against the Jews? The Palestinians. Okay? So the Palestinians that had nothing to do with the crimes carried out on, in Europe had to pay the price, and that's the settler colonials. But regarding Mark's question, we have two views on how to deal with racism. One view says human rights, and that we are all human, we all share a certain dignity, and we should all share an equal allocation of rights. Another solution is the nation state, and that the nation state will be defined according to a certain people that it circumscribes and defends. And that was the Zionist solution to anti-Semitism, okay? And therefore, from a Zionist perspective, this whole idea of traditional anti-Semitism, the idea that there's a kind of uh, uh, global control of Jewish, ba Jewish bankers or Jewish media global controls the globe and all these blood libels and denial that the Holocaust existed, all these kinds of notions of anti-Semitism are accepted by the IHRA, but the IHRA adds this other component, and that is that criticism against the state of Israel, not any, but harsh criticism against the state of Israel or the, an anti-Zionist or non-Zionist stance becomes also a form of, of anti-Semitism because Israel is the Jewish state. Israel was created in order to protect the Jews and therefore not agreeing with the idea of Israel as the Jewish state is a form of Zionism. And so there is a clash because the Jewish state, through its very definition, is in a sense an apartheid regime that denies human rights to a whole group of people. So Israel is a mode of racial governance where me as a Jew, I have more rights as the Palestinian citizen living not far from me. So it's a form of racial governance that allocates certain rights to one group and lesser rights to another. Now that form of racial governance is supposed to protect against racism, but it's supposed to protect against racism only against one group. It's discriminatory in its protection of racism. So it, it, it says we are anti-racist. We were created to protect Jews against a form of racial governance that wanted to eliminate them. But as it does that, it introduces a different form of racial governance that is anti-Palestinian, okay? Human rights offers a totally different solution to it. And the, the solution human rights offers is that we're all equal and that the people is everyone that basically uh, shares or inhabits the same territory. So it's a very different kind of solution to anti semitism And what we see and what we have seen is that there's a clash now between those. So the Human Rights Watch, or Amnesty International, or the Israeli Human Rights Organization, B'Tselem, or El Chak, the Palestinian Human Rights Organization, when they put out reports that say Israel's an apartheid regime, they are blamed of being anti-Semitic by pointing out that Israel is a mode of racial governance that does not allocate rights equally. 
that renders them anti-Semitic according to this definition. Because the definition was created in order to protect Israel from criticism like the claim that it is an apartheid regime. Yeah, so, um, we talk a lot uh, about the weaponization of, anti, uh, of, of, of anti-Semitism. The IHRA, of course, is, is part of it, and it's a big weapon in, in, that, in that armamentarium. Um, and it's very effective, certainly, against, um, against Christians, uh, who do, that's the last name you want to be called. Do you have any thoughts about how to how to deal with that? How to disarm um, those defenders of Israel, those apologists for Israel, who want Israel to keep doing what it's doing and to turn off or, or, or shut up or disable those who want to challenge it? Um, what's what what can they do? Help. I mean, first of all, it is extremely potent weapon because being called an anti-Semite is, you know, you you lose your reputation. And today, with the web and everything, once that starts circulating, you can't get a job. You can't, you know, no one's going to befriend you. No one. You no out of office, like Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, you know. Yeah, a, yeah. I mean. It, it toppled the government here. Yeah. Now. It's major. Now, there was recently a ruling in the UK which was interesting because someone was blamed of being an anti Semite, some anti Zionist person who was an anti Zionist was blamed of being an anti Semite. And the court ruled that Zionism is a political ideology and therefore not a protected characteristic. Hmm. So if I say something about you because you're Jewish, or if I say something about you because of your gender, or if I say something about, something about you because of your race, all these are protected characteristics. And saying something about them, something bad about them, you know, like a misogynist claim or something, is a hate crime, at least in the UK. What they are trying to do is make criticism of Israel into a hate crime. And what the court said is, no, criticism of a country, of a nation, or criticism of Zionism, is criticism of a political ideology, and therefore it is not a hate crime. It can be offensive. No one's saying it's not offensive when I say Israel's an apartheid regime. I'm sure it offends me. Okay? Uh, but whether it is outside of the law, whether it is a hate crime, is a different question. And what we want to do is make that distinction. And, and we have to insist on that distinction. And we have to continue saying what we believe in. And indeed, as a Jew, that's what the great Jewish prophets taught us. You speak truth to power. Okay? You cannot start fabricating things because of power. You speak back truth. And we have to stand up. Now it's easier for Jews to do it. Most of my research in the last years has been as a, on human shields. So if you're not Jewish, but you have Jewish friends, use them as human shields. Let them say. Because we are more protected. Yes, yesterday I received an email that I'm a self-hating Jew because I had an article in Al Jazeera English online. I received those from time to time. But still, I am much more protected and much more privileged on this issue than many Christians, than all Christians, and Muslims for sure. So I, I take on that role because I am privileged as a Jew 
and more able to criticize Israel than non-Jews. But I don't think silence of non-Jews is the answer either. I think all of us, we have a responsibility and we have solidarity. At the, at the core here is a solidarity with the Palestinians. And if I shut up because I'm afraid that I'm not in solidarity with and and I have an obligation, I mean, an obligation morally to be with the underdog. That's uh, at least how I feel. That's my uh, moral perception. You could you could say that it's shifting. Um, you know what happened. Uh, just one example: the, the Episcopalians here in the United States recently had a general conference. And from their grassroots, and they've been working on this for decades, they brought up a couple of resolutions saying, stop military aid to Israel, Israel is an apartheid state, um, things like that. The bishops, because it's a very top-down authoritarian, you know, think of Church of England, that's what we got here, um, uh, blocked them all, because they had the power to do that. Not even to get to the floor to a vote. And then things went crazy. I mean, people demonstrated, a lot of the people, just the rank and file, who would come as, as delegates, basically forced the bishops to say, oh, oh, okay, we'll bring it back to the floor. And a couple of them got through. They, they, they drew the line, we won't use the word apartheid, we won't use the word genocide. But at least things got voted on, and a couple of things got through with the language changed a little bit, but it did it did change. And I've been seeing that as well over the, over the past years, and I'm sure others as well. You could make the argument that, that it's shifting. So here's here's what I want to ask you. First of all, it's a little bit personal. You may not want to answer it. Um, there, a lot of people are leaving Israel. There is a brain drain. People are getting out. You were kind of you and Elon maybe were among the first, but uh, uh, others who have the privilege to do so and the options are a, are leaving. How does it feel to you? to have had to leave your country? Do you ever think of going back? Do you have hopes that ever there would ever be a chance for you, for you to come back if that would be an option? I hope you don't mind the question, but uh, I think it's something, frankly, that many Americans are starting to think about now as well. So it strikes home for us. Um, so my, I'll tell you the story. Uh, my partner and I are academics. We both received a research grant to come to the UK for two years. And we came and began working here. What year was that? This was 2016. You still worked for Ben Gurion? I worked for Ben Gurion until 1819. I kept the job without being there. But I was, okay. he left in 2016. You weren't Ben Gurion, no. I wasn't. Yeah. Right. Um, and then I was offered a job here. And, and what you said there is really true. I'm very privileged in this. I'm an academic. I can move more easily than most people with most jobs. And then came the question, are we going to move? Our kids were 8 and 11 at the time. Mm. Uh, and as you said, I'm a third generation Israeli Jew, and I'm very Israeli. I don't know if it comes across, but, you know, people that have traveled or lived in other countries, there's co certain cultural codes, certain understandings that make you feel comfortable in a certain country, like I'm sure most people here feel comfortable in the United States, they might disagree with the policies, they might, but they understand the codes. They understand, they get along in the in society. And of course, that's how I felt about Israel. And I'm very, emo many, many friends there, very emotionally attached. And it was a major decision, a lot of sleepless nights. And ultimately, the passage you read at the beginning, Mark, uh, from the Boycott Israel article, what 
made the decision, the decision both my partner and I said to said in our conversations when we were discussing it, that if we were without children, we wouldn't have left. We would have stayed to have the fight there. But we believed that, or we didn't want to raise them there. And so we moved. Um, and we knew... In a, the, we knew it was a the, the decision was very hard because we knew it was a one way ticket. Mm. I knew, I know, I can never get a job again. The minute I left my, t I had a tenured position. They couldn't fire me. They, the, the minister of education demanded that the university fire me. Things like what you see now in Congress with the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard now. So I was under those kinds of pressure before, but the tenure protected me. And so when I gave up my tenure, I knew I could never come back. And, uh, and indeed, uh, I go back, of course, because I have aging parents and, and so forth, and I go back, I've been back four times since October 7th, not a seventh, four times in the past eight, nine months I've been there. Uh, so I go back quite frequently to to be with my parents and help them a bit, uh, but uh, it was a one way ticket in terms of living. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> let me ask us to step out on into the minefield, or maybe the 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 uh, the rat hole. Of talking about politics and the one state versus two states and all of this, you write actually back in two thousand nine. This, this this struck me in two thousand nine in the LA Times article. You supported two states. That's where you were at that time. You saying, "Yeah, it's not going to work to have a one state um, uh, that." Uh, very small percentage of the population of both Palestinians and Israelis supported a single binational state, and that the boycott, this was your argument for BDS, was an effective way to bring that about through outside pressure on Israel. No. That was 2009, right? Do, do, you still, do you still feel that way? And then I've got a follow-up question. I don't know. Well, my, my thing, first of all, my thinking has evolved over the years quite a lot. I was raised Zionist and I was a Zionist for many, many years. It's not, uh, there's no secret in that. I believed in the two-state solution for many years. I think well over a decade. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't see it as a possibility. I mean, there's there's a few issues here. First, what is the most ethical final solution? And the most ethical final solution for me is not a two-state solution, it's, it's a one-state solution. It's a state again where where the people that inhabit the land are the people. And not only some of those that inhabit the land are the people and some are not. This whole idea of separating based on uh, ethnicity or religion or whatever, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think, I mean, I think we need to look at what unites us and what brings us together as a collective rather than at what separates us. And for many, well over a decade, I've been for a one state where, where uh, Jews and Palestinians live together. And indeed, in, 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 in Be'er Sheva, be even right when my first child, who's going to be 20 this year, was born, uh, we began establishing a Jewish-Palestinian school where half the children are Jews and half Palestinians, and they go to school together. And for me, that is the one-state solution. That is the future. That is what I would like to see as, as, a, as a resolution. Uh, then there's the pragmatic issue. Which one is more pragmatic at, at a certain period of time? And, and, and the way I see it now is that there is a one state in Israel. There's one state from the river to the sea. 
and it's an apartheid. And so the question is, what is more pragmatic to separate the state or to democratize? I think that it's probably easier today to democratize it than to move populations in terms of taking... We, Israel had 8,000 settlers in the Gaza Strip. 8,000. And it, removing them from the Gaza Strip created a national trauma. There's 600,000 or 700,000. 10% of the Jewish population now lives in the West Bank. Well, I don't see them moving. And so I've gone, but... Let me say this. I'm not, if someone came to me tomorrow morning and said, Neve, you have a two state solution, take it, leave it, I'd take it. Of course I'd take it. Is it my preferred solution? No. Is it the way we want to see this world as separation? No. But I would take it. Uh, but it's not my favorable solution. Yeah. Speaking to us, and I'm assuming we're all Americans who are listening to you. What would be your your counsel to us, based on your work, um, based on your just who you are, um, as Americans, um, as members of churches, communities, political parties? Um, for what what kind of activism we should we should carry out that we should maintain? So thanks for that question. Uh, I'll just answer Sally. She asked if it's Hagar School. Yeah. So uh, my partner and I were among the three four families that created Hagar. As to your question, what we've been seeing in the past nine months is quite incredible. But I wanna, what we've been seeing is a massive mobilization of civil society to protect the Palestinians from the genocidal violence. Mm -hmm. And the ruling elites are more or less, they may have swayed a bit, but they're more or less where they have. And there's this major gap between civil society and the ruling elites. The change is not in the ruling elites. The ruling elites still have the same uh, positions they've had. The change is in civil And I want to discuss that very briefly. So I wrote, my first book was Israel's Occupation, and it was the history of the occupation from 1967 to 2008. And I got to 1987, where in the, December 1987, when the first Intifada erupted. And the story of the eruption of the first Intifada is very interesting. If you open a textbook or any book about the first Intifada, you'll find that this is the way the Intifada erupted. There was a truck leaving the Gaza Strip and there were Palestinian laborers on their way to Israel to work in farms or in construction. About a third of Palestinian workforce in, from the Gaza Strip would go every day to Israel to work. The truck ran over seven workers, killed them. And the same day or the following day, they had funeral processions in the Gaza Strip. And in Jabalia refugee camp, there was a funeral procession for two of the people that were killed. And there were Israeli soldiers were with military jeeps there. The, the people in the procession started throwing stones at the... Uh, at the uh, at the uh, soldiers, the soldiers shot back and killed another Palestinian, and and that's how the 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 inter intifada, and and then the kind of the intifada, uh, people started throwing stones and in the other villages and towns all across Gaza Strip, 
and then that went to the West Bank, and the first popular uprising erupted. Um, and and that was the story I had read before well, while researching the book, and that was the story everyone knew. Mm. And when I began re doing the actual research, I looked into the military protocols about uh, kind of disturbances in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip throughout the years. And what I noticed that in the, in already beginning in 1980 or 1981, there were stone throwing events in different villages in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip to the level that in, in it began with 80 incidents a year in 1981, and then it jumped up to 150 incidents in 1982 and kept on going up and up. So December 1987, when Jabalia had the, the stone throwing, which everyone understands as the eruption of the first intifada, by that time, they were, there were several incidents of stone throwing in the West Bank and Gaza Strip every day. Mm. And so we understand Jabalia as a kind of the straw that broke the camel's back or that erupted through it, the father erupted, but that's not true. Without all those other stories, of stone throwing every day in different parts, it wouldn't have erupted. If it would have come as the first time the stone, nothing would have happened. Now, how does this answer your question? What should we do? We should create story. Our role is to create stories. We don't know when the story will erupt into an intifada, when the story, when the change will come. Our obligation is to create stories, okay? So that's the first part. Each and every one of us has to try to create. Going to a protest is creating a story. Writing a letter to your, to your, to your representative is creating a story. Writing a letter to the press about an article that appeared is creating a story. Donating money to something is creating a story. Going to the West Bank is creating a story. Going to different people. All these are stories. We need to continue creating them. The fact that there is such mobilization of civil society today against what's happening in Gaza, again, didn't come out of nothing. It came out of years of working and working, and Mark and I, we were on a panel together maybe 12, 15 years ago, and these kind of connections, and this is building it up for the change. And so each one has to do what they're most comfortable in doing, and sometimes also leave their comfort zone and do something. And, and that's how we contribute to the struggle. That's my belief. And, and we need to, our obligation in the world is to create stories, stories of resistance, or stories of liberation, stories of solidarity. Thank you, Neve. You know, and this would be, if I were, this would be a great, this would be a perfect time to say thank you for your stories and your work, right? Which I think is a major contribution and continues to be. And we could wrap things up, but I can't resist asking you as a, a follow-up question, maybe as a pushback to what you're saying about resistance in the Intifada, which is Joyce's question of from about 10 minutes ago. She says, can a one-state solution be possible if a large portion of residents believe in a racist ideology and the others don't? We've had lots of experience like this in the USA, right? So we're back to Israel and what, what, what's, what is possible? Uh, what, what do you think about that? You've been on the inside. Well, racism is not an innate characteristic. We we are educated to hate the other. Mm -hmm. Um and and we can be educated not to hate the other. 
Um, so when I was growing up in Israel, Satan was Anwar Sadat, right? Egypt's leader, and before that, Nasser. And I'm sure that for the French, the Germans were these monsters and, and, and so forth. History has taught us that, that people can change. I think Joyce is absolutely right that racism is so ingrained and so deep-seated now in Israel that it's very difficult to imagine. And 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 it's it's difficult to imagine, and it's there. I mentioned the school that we created. It starts from when the kids are in the stomach of their mothers, and then it's in the education system from the very beginning. And and we need to change it from its roots. Okay, and through these small projects, it's there's no way to kind of. There's no silver bullet, and it's hard work, and it's 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 difficult, and eighty or ninety or even ninety five percent of the time you fail, but you you grow through the work itself, even though you fail, and other people's people grow. So I feel like in mo if I look back at most of my struggles, I think that probably 98% of them are failed. But I've I've created communities, I've created friends, I've had solidarities, and there's a lot of joy in defying Big Brother. And it, it brings joy and meaning to life. And so that's, I think, our way in the world, and uh, I think Joyce is right. If you she asked you asked me what is the solution, I said that I think is the best solution. Do you ask me if you would have asked me? Do you think we'll get to it in your lifetime? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I wish we would. I hope we would. I hope to be surprised. Words, um, important words, speaking about Israel, thinking about you as a as an Israeli, thinking maybe maybe it would be a place to come back and bring your family, return to your country, speaking to us as Americans who are looking at you don't want to go there, but creating the stories as you put it, and building community at those levels is all we can do and it's the most important thing that we can do just for our own survival and that history this is nothing new history has been like this forever for my friends and, and this is how the church got started you know it was a, a bunch of people who were who were saying no to the roman empire huddling in basements and hiding in little houses all over the mediterranean bases saying that we're going to, we got to create something different you know, this is not this is not working for us, and you know. So anyway, it's it's been wonderful hanging out with you this hour. I'm hoping maybe, you know, in your session, inshallah, we can do this again in Seattle over coffee, or in London, or in Tel Aviv, or in Ramallah, or in Bethlehem, I mean, somewhere. Uh, we have to keep talking, and uh, I really, really thank you for the time that you. Yeah. That you've made to spend, to spend with us. It's really been a pleasure.